In this strategy segment, we are going to be discussing three mistakes for you to avoid when playing heads up, no limit, Texas Hold'em, one-on-one, battling it out. Understand, the heads up has the potential to be extremely profitable with huge edges available because you are playing against only one player. And if you have a nice edge on them, you are going to be able to consistently crush them, especially if you make fewer mistakes than your opponents and your opponents are making egregious mistakes at any point throughout the hand. In this webinar, we are going to be discussing heads up, pre-flop strategy to make sure that you are starting with good, strong, fundamentally sound ranges. We're also going to be discussing a few post-flop tips to help you gain an edge. And also, we're going to be discussing how to keep a good, strong winning mindset when playing heads up because variance is wild. Understand that when you are playing heads up, you have to play a ton of hands, way more than you may be accustomed to if you're used to playing six-handed or nine-handed poker. If you try to wait for a strong hand and then just try to load your money in, you're going to get run over and you're going to blind out. And that's not good. Understand, you do not have to play perfectly pre-flop against most players, but you want to be sure to focus on good, strong fundamentals. We're going to be just showing you some charts pertaining to these. But three main points I want to be sure that you're aware of is that you only raise or fold from the button. You do not want to limp because when you limp, you let the player in the big blind see the flop for free which is not ideal. You'd rather charge them with their weak hands. Also, from out of position, from the big blind, when the button raises, you want to be three betting with a good, strong, linear range. Not a polarized range like you often do when you're playing at a multi-person table. Heads up, out of position, you're going to be three betting with a good, strong, linear range. And then you're going to want to make sure that when you are in position and you raise and then the player in the big blind three bets, that you call three bets in position quite often. You cannot fold and wait for only good hands. So let's take a look at this. We're going to be discussing playing 100 big blinds deep. You can extrapolate a little bit if you're playing a little bit shallower or a little bit deeper. From the button, you're going to want to raise to two and a half big blinds with roughly this range. All the hands in yellow want to raise. All the hands in gray, you'll find not very many of them. Jack four folds, but not a whole lot else. All the junky hands in gray, such as queen three, jack four, 10 four, eight four, six three, three two, off suit. Those hands are folding, but everything else is good enough to play on the button. And you should raise it to two and a half big blinds. If you're playing in a game that has a high rake, you can play tighter, but you want to play roughly this range from the button with a raise. And I realize it may feel uncomfortable to play queen four and 10 five off suit, but these hands are profitable when you are in position against a random hand. Turns out you get to play a lot of hands when you are in position. Again, I want to make it clear, you're raising to two and a half big blinds with all these hands. You are not limping with any of them. Just raise all these hands and you will be fine. Next, let's discuss playing versus the 2.5 big blind button raise. Again, 100 big blinds deep. In this scenario, we are going to three bet with all of the hands in yellow, but we need to pay attention to the frequency here. And all the hands that say one, that means 100%. So we see ace 10 suited, three bets 100% of the time. Ace nine suited, three bets 0.5, which means 50% of the time. And we see king two suited, three betting 0.2% of the time. I'm sorry, not 0.2, 20% of the time. So we have hands like, well, the good strong best hands are three betting every time. Hands that are pretty good are three betting about half the time. And then some of the weakest hands that do want to three bet for balance purposes are three betting a smaller percentage. We see some hands three betting 20%. Then hands like 9-8 offsuit three betting 10%. You do need to mix it up. I want to make that very, very clear. If you only three bet with the hands that are three betting 100% of the time in this scenario, you're three betting with a range that's just too strong. And that's actually a problem. You want to mix in some, call them bluffs, right? Take a look at this chart over here. This chart shows the hands that are calling pre-flop. So notice hands like king two suited are three betting 20% and calling 80%. Notice every single hand that is suited calls a pre-flop raise or three bets of pre-flop raise from the big blind. You cannot fold any suited hands. Notice the only hands that are folding again are the worst hands. Jack four offsuit, poor jack four offsuit. No one gets to play the jack four offsuit. That hand again folds to a pre-flop raise. 
Queen 2 folds to a preflop raise, 3 2 offsuit folds to a preflop raise. And you'll see some of the weakest hands, like 4 3 offsuit, calling a preflop raise 25% of the time and folding 75% of the time. I don't think it is 100% mandatory that if you are just getting started with heads up to defend the absolute weakest hands at these frequencies. No, this is a small frequency anyway with, with most of them. But if you are trying to play good, strong heads up, no limit hold'em, you do need to play with roughly these frequencies in these scenarios. You cannot be too weak and too tight. You will get run over. I cannot make that any more clear. By the way, when you do three bet, when the button makes it two and a half, you're gonna be making it 10 big blinds when you decide to three bet with these hands. You may think, why so big? Well, it's not so big. It's four times the opponent's initial raise. And from out of position, you don't really care if the opponent folds when you have a hand like the Jack-8 offsuit. And you don't mind making the pot big when you have a hand like aces. So you put your opponent in a pretty nasty spot in that scenario where they are going to fold. You have to, re uh, some portion of the time, you have to realize that whenever they raise, if you make it seven, they're going to call basically every time. And that is not good for you. Here's how the button should play facing a three bet to 10 big blinds in this scenario. Notice they are four betting pretty infrequently, only with pocket tens and better every time, ace king every time. And then all the other hands that are continuing some tiny frequency of the time. Notice, queen six offsuit is four betting to 23 big blinds out of the 100 big blind stack, 4% of the time, almost none. If you wanted to take a lot of these 4% hands and consolidate them into one hand every time, I think that's probably okay. It's not that big of a deal as long as your opponent does not know which hand you are three betting 100% of the time and which ones you're three betting, or sorry, which hands you're four betting 100% and which hands you're four betting none as a bluff. But I do want to point out here that it is important to mix it in, mix in four bet bluffs with a lot of your hands, some small frequency of the time. Uh, notice that we do err towards four betting hands like ace x offsuit. Take a look at all these ace x offsuit. We see like ace six offsuit, four betting 10%, ace five, four betting 20%, ace two, four betting 15%. Notice though, we are not really four betting so much with hands that would have to four bet and have to fold if the opponent goes all in. So notice hands like ace two suited, four bet almost none, 2% of the time, and they call 98% of the time. That's because when you have a hand like ace two suited, you really wanna see a flop. So you're gonna find that a lot of the bluffs are gonna come from the ace x offsuit region because if you do four bet with ace x and your opponent shoves, you can easily fold. And having an ace in your hand gives you a blocker such that they are going to have hands that can shove on you far less often because we're going to see a lot of their hands that want to shove are aces, ace king, and some ace x suiteds. So blocking those is quite nice because that makes them shove on you less often. Notice that when we are facing the three bet, we are folding out only the absolute weakest suited hands, but we are folding out a whole lot of offsuit hands. When we raise the button with a hand like king seven or nine seven or seven six offsuit, all of those and the opponent four bets us, or three bets us, we're just folding in that scenario. It's okay to raise and then fold. Notice a hand like uh, king nine offsuit, only calls 60% of the time. It's okay to fold it when you get four, uh, three bet, especially if your opponent is three betting very big, if your game rakes a lot, or if you think your opponent's three betting very tightly, you should definitely under defend compared to what we are showing you here. That said, the decent suited hands really do not like folding, pairs never fold, and strong high cards also never fold, okay? Facing the button four bet. So button raises, big blind three bets, button four bets. Here is how we should continue facing the four bet. We are ripping it all in with ace king, kings, queens, jacks, tens half the time, nines 20% of the time, aces 65% of the time, ace eight, ace seven, ace three, and ace two suited 20% of the time, King Queen offsuit, uh, barely any, 5% of the time. Ace Jack and Ace 10 offsuits, 10% and 5%. And then we are calling pretty tightly. We're calling pretty tightly in this spot. Remember, we are initially three betting with this range, kind of a wide range. We are calling only with decently strong hands because we're going to be out of position, right? Out of position, you're going to under-realize your equity, and that forces you to continue with only very good hands. So when you do three bet with a bluff, and your opponent four bets you, you fold. It's okay. It's okay to let go the weakest portion of your range. Do notice though, we are calling the 23 big blind 
four bet, 13 big blinds more, with all of these decently strong hands. Lots of good, strong suited connectors, suited big cards, some offsuit high cards, mainly ace, queen, king, queen, and ace jack. And we're going to the flop. Okay? Speaking of which, let's go to the flop. Let's discuss a big mistake that people make on the flop, and that is continuation betting too often. You have to understand, when you play very wide ranges pre-flop, you simply must find lots of checks because you will rarely have a huge range or nut advantage. This is very different if you raise, let's say, under the gun at a nine-handed table with a good strong range, and the big blind calls and it comes all high cards, that's really good for your under the gun range because you have all the super nut hands and even your hands that aren't that good have draws, right? And your opponent's hands are going to be a whole lot of hands like eight high. Eight high is not so good on ace, king, three, right? But when you're raising with a very wide range, you now are also going to have a lot of junk and that forces you to do a decent amount of checking because you're just not going to have that much of an advantage ever. So boards where you check a high amount of the time when you raise and your opponent calls and then they check on the flop are going to be ace, king, high boards, King queen, high, king, queen, high boards, 10 high and lower boards. So all three cards, 10 or lower, especially when they're all connected. Low paired boards, usually 9-9x nine, nine, and lower. And then also medium and high monotone boards, meaning that they all three have the same suit. So king, queen, three of spades. All of these boards are going to result in you checking a decent amount of the time because these boards are going to line up pretty well with the big blind caller's range. If you think about the big blind caller, they're going to have a lot of high cards, right? So ace, king, x, and king, queen, x hit them very hard. They're also going to have a lot of medium connected type hands. So the 10 high and lower connected connect quite well. The low paired boards, just no one's going to have a whole lot of trips. And your opponent's going to be calling with more hands containing low cards than you will be raising, right? So if it comes jack 3-3... Three, three, yeah, you have a lot of jacks, but they're going to have the threes and you're not. So you have to check a lot on those boards. And then on the high monotone boards, you are going to be playing all the suited hands, but so are they, right? So you both have somewhat like an equal number of flushes. And that's going to result in you just not doing a whole lot of betting on those boards. So let's take a look at two examples here. Let's say we raise the king five suited, king five of spades on the button slash small blind, big blind calls, ace king six. Big blind checks. A lot of people think they should bet here because they probably have the best hand. And it's true. You probably do have the best hand. But if you bet and get raised, it's an absolute disaster. And if you bet and get called, it's also not particularly great because your opponent's never folding an ace and never folding a king, and you lose to all the aces and most of the kings. So this is a nice spot to just let it go check, check, and try to get to the showdown. Turns it to a spades. That's good. Opponent bets $6. Some people think we should raise because we have a pair and a flush draw. But no, 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 no. We are mostly going to have a marginal made hand on the river. Second pair, bad kicker. Second pair, bad kicker does not want to raise. It just wants to call and keep the opponent in with all their potential bluffs. That way, when we are against a better hand, we lose as little as possible. When we do call and get the flush, if the opponent bets, we can easily put in a raise, right? And this is a nice spot. Whenever they do have a bluff, they are going to feel somewhat inclined to keep bluffing the river to try to get us off of a hand like a six or worse or maybe pocket queens and worse. This is a great spot to call and then just don't fold on the river. River's a six, the opponent bets small. We're gonna call on most rivers, I think, in this scenario. They have nine eight of spades, we win. Notice if they did, river the spade. Ooh, we would've won a very nice pot. Nice, easy hand. We don't wanna play a big pot here because when we're against a better hand, a better hand literally never folds to a raise. And we don't wanna bet and then face a raise with this exact hand. So check it down, play a small and medium pot and go from there. Medium hands typically want to play medium pots. Here's another one. We raise just with seven, four spades on the button. Big blind calls. King, queen, five. They check. Some people think they should bet this because they have a very, very junky draw. They don't really mind betting it and folding it, which is true. But this is a spot where we have to do a decent amount of checking because we should expect to get check raised or at least check called in this scenario a lot of the time. And the nice thing about this spot is that if we let it go check, check, and they check again on the turn, they probably don't have a whole lot of kings, in which case we can now start bluffing the turn and river. I want to make it clear, the plan here is not to check it back and then just check down and lose with seven high. We are going to try to find bluffs at some point a lot of the time with this hand. Check, check, though. Turns a six of spades, that's good. They check, we are now definitely going to bet. We use a $15 bet and a 25, and they call. I can already tell you, we're probably going to be bluffing this river. 
Yes, they're always going to call us with a king. They're probably going to call us with a queen. But if they have a hand worse than that, they're usually going to end up folding by the river. And they could certainly have a whole lot of sixes and fives. River's a two. We have nothing. That's a kind of bad card to bluff on the river. But we have a hand that can get a whole lot of better hands to fold in the scenario. You may say, my opponents are going to call with any pair. Well, you have, then have to ask, will they fold out ace high? Will they call a turn bet with ace high? Will they fold out nine eight? Will they fold out eight seven? These hands all beat us, right? And some people will have these hands in this scenario a large chunk of the time. So this is a spot where I think betting the river is mandatory. Absolutely mandatory. We bet 30 bucks, as we would do if we had a bad king or a queen. And they fold. And we went a little pot. Nice and easy. Let's discuss another scenario. Many players do not check raise often enough. When will you check raise? That's when the button raises, you call the big blind, the flop comes, you check, they bet, and then you raise. With wide ranges, as we are always playing heads up, you should go for thinner value all over the game tree. Many players simply do not check raise nearly often enough. The number one spot I see people miss playing good, strong, sound poker is when it comes to check raising. They simply have a weak, tight check raising strategy so that they only check raise with the nuts. And that is a blunder. There are two main hands that you want to be check raising with a large chunk of the time. And those are your strongest flopped hands and also draws with good equity. So let's take a look at those. Small blind raises. We call the big blind with a 10-5 of spades. Flop comes. Seven, six, four, one spade, two clubs. We check. Opponent bets 40% pot with our open into straight draw. Backdoor flush draw. 10 high. This is an excellent hand to check raise because it has no showdown value but very good equity. So we're going to want to check raise this spot a ton of the time. So... We check, they bet $2, we check raise to eight. And I can already tell you, we're gonna be barreling this hand a lot of the time. Draws with decent equity usually like to continue bluffing. Jack of spades turn is excellent. This is gonna make some of the opponent's marginal hands a whole lot worse. If they did have a pair of seven, sixes, or fours, they could have to not worry about us having a random jack with a jack high flush draw or something like that. Also, we could just have the nuts. We would check raise with hands like two pair on the flop a ton of the time, straights and sets sometimes, right? So we're going to have a lot of very strong hands in this scenario. So this is a great spot to bet. And when we are betting here, we want to be betting big. When the board contains two flush draws, you're usually going to find that a big bet size is ideal, especially when I, by check raising the flop, am announcing that I have a whole lot of nut hands or good draws in my range. And when my opponent does not re-raise me, they start to lose a lot of their very good hands. So this is a spot where we have all the nuts. They probably are lacking some of them, so we get to keep applying pressure. This time they let it go. We win a nice little pot. Let's take a look at another one. Small blind raises. We call big blind. Flop comes. 10 4 2. We have king 10. There's a flush draw available. This is an excellent spot to check raise. We check. They bet. Tiny. Definitely put in the raise to about 12 or 13 bucks. We do make it $13 this time. You may ask, why so big? When your opponent bets one big blind, you want to be raising quite large. You have to realize you. To some extent, are raising in relation to the size of the pot, not in relation to your opponent's bet. A lot of people think they should always make it three times their opponent's bet. But if your opponent bets one big blind, you don't want to make it three because they have to put in, in this scenario, $4 to try to win, what would it be, 22? They're obviously not going to fold much of anything, which means they're not really making an error by calling in position with much of anything. So this is a spot where we do want to make it quite big in relation to their bet, but it's not actually that big in relation to the pot. We make it 13. They call. Turns a king of clubs. Who is this turn better for? That's usually what you want to be asking yourself. Is this turn good for me or good for them? Well, you want to ask, am I raising with a whole lot of random kings on the flop? And the answer is no. Not at all. Will the opponent bet the flop with a king and then call a raise with a king? Well, if they have king X of hearts, they'll definitely call. They might even call a hand like ace king. Maybe they float with king queen. Kind of hard to have king queen of spades here because we have the spade. But... Suppose we did not have the king of spades, then obviously they could. That'd be another hand they could have, king, queen, king, jack of, with, of spades. So look, this is a spot where I think continuing to bet is fine, but this is also a very nice spot to put in a check raise because we are going to have a whole lot of 10x 
to check raise the flop, and the king is very bad for 10x. So we check. Opponent bets. Two-thirds pot. We could call it a slow play, but I think raising here is very good too because I do think the opponent's range is going to contain a whole lot of draws and a whole lot of hands that we crush, such as flush draws, maybe stuff like queen jack, also stuff like pocket queens. These are hands that the opponent certainly could have that we can put in a very nasty spot by raising. Realize that if we check here and the opponent bets and we basically never raise, we make it to where the opponent can value bet very thinly against us and bluff us very wide because they're going to realize their equity with all those hands. But by check raising, you deny them equity with some portion of their hands, and that is incredibly valuable. So we raise to 50 bucks. Opponent goes all in. Some people think, oh no, they went all in. I could lose. Yeah, you could. Sometimes you're going to lose. You're going to get stacked sometimes in heads up. Such is life. Easy call here. Queen Jack of Hearts, we hold. They did have good equity. But notice, in this scenario, perhaps, perhaps, if we just call their bet on the turn, they're just going to check it back on the river and not lose any money. Or maybe they bluff the river for $40 and we win $40 more. Instead, we get all of our money in very good and we stack them. And that is exactly what we are going for. Let me give you one more bonus tip. Let's discuss some heads up mindset mistakes. Inexperienced players typically have two major mindset flaws that are heightened when playing heads up, no limit, hold them. First, they underestimate short-term variance. They do not realize that you're gonna get stacks in all the time. When you are playing only 100 big blinds deep or shallower in heads up poker, which will often be the case in many cash games online and in tournaments, especially if you're playing heads up, money's gonna be going in a lot if you both play pretty well. And a lot of people don't like that. They think they're supposed to get their money in with the nuts every time and win every time. Hate to break it to you, that is not how it goes when you're playing against anyone who is decent at all heads up. Understand that you are going to have big swings. It's okay. Realize that and accept it. Also, many inexperienced players drastically overestimate their ability. They think that they are far better than their opponents. And you know, you may be far better than some of your opponents. But you may find yourself against someone who's decent at heads up and your edge is actually quite small. And if that's the case, maybe it's not even worth you playing the game, but realize you're not just going to smash your opponents all the time. A lot of poker players have a giant ego and they think they're really, really good at poker. If you're here watching this, hopefully you realize we are all trying to learn and improve our skills. So we know we're not the best players ever. So hopefully you don't deal with this, but a lot of people do. And I think a lot of people take losses heads up really badly, even though there's a lot of variance short term. And also, even if you're better than your opponent, you are going to lose some portion of the time. And that is okay. You're supposed to lose some portion of the time. Stay humble. Consistently work hard to improve your skills. And understand that you signed up for the swings. If you know what you signed up for and you accept what you signed up for, don't let the inevitable swings of poker bother you. They are normal and good. The fact that the weaker players win sometimes is the reason that poker is such a profitable game. It is not a bug of the game. It is a feature. Enjoy it. So those are it. Three mistakes that you must avoid when playing heads up. Mistake number one is playing way too tightly pre-flop. Mistake number two is continuation betting too often. And mistake number three is not check raising nearly often enough. If you fix these three errors alone and you keep a good, strong mindset, you're going to be ready next time someone charges you heads up for rolls. That's going to be it for today. If you enjoyed today's video, click the like and subscribe button down below. Also click the notification bell if you want lots more strategy segments like this. If you like this video, let me know and we will give you lots more strategy segments to up your skills in all sorts of situations in No Limit Texas Hold'em. I appreciate all of you being here today. Good luck in your games. And if you get challenged heads up for rolls, assuming you decide to say yes, I hope you take all of your opponent's money.